Okay, um, good morning or good afternoon or good night, everyone. Uh, this is June. Uh, as I have mentioned, sorry for uh, the continuous announcement regarding this class, but um, I wanted to do the live uh, lecture uh, tomorrow or on Thursday at 10.30 a.m. However, today I got this email saying there is a problem with the LMS online live lecture system. So um, I have decided to um, do the lecture, the recorded lecture and um, post it on the LMS website. So the currently you got, we can still do this LMS live thing if we use our own hotspot data. So, so if you are in school, uh, the school Wi-Fi or school, the, the, the LAN internet doesn't work with this live lecture system. However, you can access it with the, uh, your own hotspot, but I think that'll consume a lot of your data, right? So I don't want to do that. Okay. So, so, so yeah, so we'll do the lecture, uh, the recorded lecture. All right. So today we're going to learn about atoms or, uh, punja atoms uh, we're gonna learn about how the atoms atomic structure and interatomic bonding and we are doing this because atoms all right consists any given material right it can be just one atom, right, like gold, copper, aluminum, or it can be a mix of atoms, right? H2O, NaCl, gold boron, right? So, so let's look at these atom structures and how they are connected or how the bonding is formed and we are interested in this bonding because basically bonding decides the properties okay so so let's look at take a look so to, as i mentioned understanding the interatomic Bonding is the first step towards understanding or explaining materials properties, right? So we are going to review the atomic structure such as electrons, protons, neutrons, blah, blah, blah. Atomic bonding in solids, primary bonding and secondary bonding and yeah, the other stuff. So, so today lecture is, we'll begin from high school level chemistry and i believe this will be a review to many of you okay so i hope you listen to this lecture relaxed all right Maybe with a cup of coffee. All right, I think that's too much. All right, so let's take a look. So this is atom, right? We all know that atoms consist of nucleus in the middle and electrons. circle around right like like this nucleus is like a sun and these are the stars on orbit okay all right so the atom the nucleus consists of the neutrons and the positively charged protons and they are surrounded by negatively charged electrons so atoms consists of nu nucleus plus electrons and these electrons or protons are electrically charged 
by this value, the famous value, right? 1.6 to the minus 19 coulomb, right? So number of protons in the nucleus is equal to the atomic number, right? Right. So this can be same to the number of electrons, right? Then we can say, oh, this atom is neutral, right? Or if they are not, they are charged. Okay, so so we'll get into this. Right. The protons and neutrons actually have the mass, and there is famous story how how people have measured this volume, very small volume, right? It's minus two, twenty seven, and electrons have much less mass so about roughly about thousand electrons equal to one proton in terms of mass right okay so the number of protons defines the atomic number a number of neutrons defines the isotope number. Okay. So, so when you see an atom, so this is carbon, right? This is carbon right here. Usually we write like this. All right. And this is yeah, oh, it's so right here. It's this is atomic number, and this is mass number right so 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 when the mass number is double of atomic number we can say oh the number of protons and number of neutrons are equal when the mass number is not double of atomic number then we can say oh they are not the same right? okay okay so here they show a same, these two show same chemical properties because they have the same atomic number, which is six. But the mass of this one is higher because it has one more neutron. So we can see here, we can, we can get a hint. We can get a hint from here that, oh, the chemical property of a material or atom depends on number of protons okay all right and we'll learn why throughout the next couple lectures so atomic mass unit so 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 if you're if you're a chemistry major you are familiar with this value amu right atomic mass unit right so so one amu is defined as one twelfth of atomic mass of carbon. So basically, one amu equals mass of proton, which is this or the volume we have seen earlier. So when we say atomic weight of an element, right? So weighted average. This is the weighted average of the atomic masses of atoms naturally occurring isotopes right so as i have mentioned there is 12 c6 and 13 c6 right if they are 50 to 50 percent then the atomic weight of element will be 2.5 amu right but from this volume right here we know that, oh, there are much more carbon with 12 mass number than, right? By looking at this value, we can get that, right? Okay. All right, cool. All right. So a mole is the amount of matter that has a mass in grams equal to the atomic mass in AMU of the atoms, 
right? So a mole of 12 carbon with mass number of 12 has a mass of 12 grams, right? So mole is a value. And this, in one mole, there are this many atoms and this is Avogadro's number very famous one right this is equal so if you have this right basically this number equals one gram over one amu right okay right so this number of 12 carbon will equal to 12 grams right this is exactly what they are talking about so, so atomic weight of iron is 55.933 which is much higher than carbon and and it, from common sense we know that generally iron is heavier than carbon right because it has more atomic weight right. so 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 let's look at closely right so we can calculate the number of atoms in a given volume so here is the number of atoms per cubic centimeter this is the density of the material and this is the Avogadro's number and this is atomic mass. Okay. Okay. All right. So, so basically what this does is that we know we can get the idea of the weight value from these two parameters. All right. And by multiplying this density information, we can calculate how many number of atoms are there. So, so, so let me just give you an, a quick example, all right? All right. So in case of, let's look at the case of graphite. I'm sorry. This consists of Oh, sorry. Uh, okay. These pure carbon, right? And they have a density of 2.3 grams per centimeter cubed, right? And their atomic mass is roughly 12 grams per mole, right? It's carbon, so it is 12. The mass number of carbon is roughly 12, right? And in the other case, we have a diamond. This also consists of carbon. However, the diamond is much denser. They have 3.5 grams per centimeter group and their atomic mass is 12 grams per mole it is same it's carbon so so these two value has to be same however their density is different right so so let's take a look right so how many how many number how many number what are their numbers and equals all right number uh, uh Avogadro number which is 10 to the 23 atoms per mole times 2.3 grams per cubic centimeter, so density, divided by atomic mass, which is 12 grams per mole. And if you do the calculation, it will be, oh, there are 11.5 times 10 to the 22 atoms per cubic centimeter, all right? If you do the very similar thing to the diamond, what you will get is 17.5 times 20, 10 to 22 atoms 
per centimeter cubed. Right? So from this, we can find out that, oh, the diamond has more atoms per given volume than that of graphite. And usually diamond is, not usually, diamond is much harder, right, than graphite, right? So from here, we can see, oh, even though these two materials are made of same element or same atom, which is carbon, depending on how many of them are stored or how, ma how many of them are packaged in a given area, they show a different property, right? Their densities are different, right? Then how are they possible? Why are they, why do they have different numbers of carbon in a given volume? And why, why is that? Why is diamond much, much more expensive than graphite, right? So that is all connected. It is all connected. So, so today's lecture is gonna be the base. It's gonna be the starting point to all those questions, okay? And throughout the course, hopefully before the midterm, we'll get answers to all those questions about the properties, okay? So, so in terms of properties, so, so that was very, very, very brief introduction to the atoms. And now we're gonna talk about interatomic bonds, right? So this is very funny uh, drawing that I found in a Google and I forgot to cite them. So sorry about this copyright thing, but here it is, right? So here is this atom with a, oops, let me go back to blue, right? So here's this atom with the neutron or nucleus and these electrons and they are the same, right? As you can see, it has three electrons. Here, electron is four. So this one, this one right here, have one less electron, right? So it says, damn, I lost an electron. And this one asks, are you sure? And it says, I'm positive, right? So I'm positive basically means yes. So if you uh, say, so, so I believe all of you are conducting a very high level research and I believe all of you uh, loved, love to have meeting with your uh, advisor or your PI or your professor right so when professor calls you on on a certain day and say hey hey you uh can we have a meeting in five minutes and you'll be like oh it's only five minutes oh my god right but all of you are always ready for such meetings so you'll be like yeah i'm positive why don't we just have meeting right now right right i believe that's the attitude of all all of all of you the awesome students of Digist, right? So, so this was a joke, but it's really hard to do the joke with the recorded video. So, probably I shouldn't have uh, omit or erase this slide, but I think it is too late. All right. So, yeah, I'm keep talking something weird, so I'll just move on. Okay. So, so when we talk about the bonding, right? Bond. Or let me let me just go to here, right? The bond. Bond, right? What is the bond? Right? Okay. Bond. 한국말로 하면은 유대, 뭐 끈끈함. Right? Oh, sorry, let me. Oops, sorry. Right? So, 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 so when 
you there's a two people and when they are very close all right then you say oh there is something between us 우리 둘 사이엔 뭔가 있어 우리 둘 사이에는 말로 표현하지 못할 뭔가 그런 끈끈함이 있어 뭐, 브로맨스가 있어 all right we have that bond And usually this bond is hard to break. In other words, it requires energy to break the bond, right? You need to, if you want to break the bond of something, if you want to break the bond between your best friend and the other one, then you need to spend energy, right? You need to consume energy to do so, right? So it's the same thing. Then our main idea is, okay, so bond, all right, it's basically the connection between atoms. Then our next big question is, how, much energy is required to break the bond all right so let's find out all right let's find out all right so so if you are familiar with the uh, this interatomic bonding or this uh, materials courses and so on, you probably have seen this interatomic separation and the force curve. So let me just draw it right here. Da -da -da. All, right. All right, let's go. Get this good. All right. So here, I'm gonna draw a line. And I'm gonna draw another line. All right. So this is the graph. Right, and this is R, and this is interatomic separation. Okay, so this is basically the distance between two atoms. So let's say if we have this atom and this atom, right, it is basically the distance. between these two atoms, right? And if you look at here, this is force. And when it goes to positive, it, it means it becomes more attractive, right? And when it goes to more to negative, it is repulsive. So to be on it, we are, all right. So let's take a look. Let's take a look at this, right? We all know that many materials, when they get closer and closer, there is a very strong attractive force, right? It can be a uh, dipole dipole pulling, or it can be a van der Waals pulling, but let's say there is an obvious attractive force so let's say the attractive force is small when they are apart but it suddenly becomes really big when they become close to each other right and then okay all right so that's good but when these molecules becomes too close These electrons overlap. And electrons, electrons, they are both negative charge uh, particles, uh, right? Is, they are, the, uh, sorry, electrons are negative charge. So when this negative neg to negative becomes close, they give repulsive force. So there is a very sharp generation of this repulsive force. 
So let's say this is F A All right, and this is FR repulsive force. And then there is this FN at the right here, right? So FN is the actual net force acting on the, uh, between these two uh, molecules. And you can see here it is like, like that right and when this passes zero uh oh never mind okay when this passes zero this point is r star all right. And this is the uh, optimal distance between molecules. Okay. So this is the very famous force versus interatomic separation curve. And there are and every molecules or every atoms, there is these two counteracting forces. The first is this attractive force FA, and the other one is this repulsive force FR, right? So as you can see here that this repulsive force dominates at small distances, and this atomic force dominates at larger distance, okay? Okay, so we learn about the uh, the force as a function of interatomic distance between two atoms. So let's think about in terms of energy, right? So let's talk about in terms of potential energy. Okay. So when there is two atoms nearby there's energy between them right and by keeping this certain distance and when they change the energy value also changes right and how is energy related to the uh, force? We all know from high school physics that energy equals integral of force in terms of dr. So, so if you uh, apply a force of certain function over r, this area is energy right we all know work which equals energy equals force times distance so when this force even though this force is not same we can if we take just the integral as a function of r then we can get the total energy so this is so this is the relation we get all right then we know this curve and let's draw this in terms of potential energy so this is r which is inter interatomic right interatomic distance and this is potential energy or E as a function of R so this y-axis is potential energy and and here it is zero and when it goes to positive it is actually repulsion 
So, so let's think about this thing. When there is energy, it pushes away. If you have positive energy, you can push things. Right? When you are in lack of energy, you need to take energy so you attract stuff. So, 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 so again, so the positive is repulsion and negative is attraction. Right, and and if we rewrite this previous curve, what we get is as atoms becomes close to each other, it gives a repulsive. So this is E R. And this is repulsive potential energy, all right? And when it goes to, and there's always an attraction acting to the, uh, uh, between two molecules. So this is EA, which is attractive. Okay, and when we add these two, you get the net potential energy. All right. Okay. Let me let me re redraw this. I want to be more dramatic. Okay, something like this. All right. Like. Uh, oops. Okay, this is gone. All right, I'm sorry. Uh, something like this. Okay. All right, so, so when you have this net energy, so this is net energy. All right. What the atoms want to do is they want to be in equilibrium and exactly actually and 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 that happens when the net force is zero net when the net force is zero there is this critical radius r star right and actually this is zero and and when you take the integral of f which is zero it means that your R star has to place right here. Where the potential energy is minimum. This is your R star. So this is actually the distance. The optimal distance between the two atoms is right here. And, and when that happens, there is the minimum potential energy between two atoms. Okay. And this energy here Let's call it as BO is bonding energy. Okay, okay. So so let, let me let me let me be more straightforward here. When the net force is zero between the two atoms here. Okay, maybe I'll try something different. Okay. So when, when the net force is zero, right here, it is right here. And at that, when that happens, the potential energy is minimum, right? So it has a negative value because, and they are attractive potential energy, right? So, 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 so it has this amount of attractive, potential energy between the atoms and that is bonding energy and basically 
you need to apply certain energy that is bigger than, let's say, E star bigger than EO to break the bond. So, so actually, if you look into more detail about this bonding forces and energies, you can calculate how much energy is required to break the bond, how much energy is to melt the solid, how much energy is required to break the bond, break the structure, apply heat, melt them. So, so you can calculate it. And they're all related to the melting temperature, strength as a function of temperature, their response to light their response to magnetic field. It is all related to these bonding structures. So that was very basic. Um, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, sorry for the pause. Um, so that was very basic um, introduction to the uh, bonding forces and bonding energies between two atoms. And let's look at more in closely, right? So, so, so when we talk about atomic bonding, there are uh, two classes. The first is primary bonding, and second one is the secondary bonding, right? Okay, and the primary bonding includes ionic bonding, ion cut up, covalent. Kongyu Kyorab, metallic, the um, metallic metal Kyorab, okay. So, so, so ionic is that you transfer the valence electrons. Covalent means sharing of valence electrons and they are directional. And delocalization of valence electrons. So, so metallic is the uh, actually delocalize the valence electrons can freely move around. So, okay, so, yeah, I'm, I'm saying so too much, too many times, but I believe all of you are familiar with the val what the valence electron is, right? So, so when we have a nucleus, protons plus neutrons, uh, what we have is there is a level of orbits And let's put one more here in the middle. All right. And these are called energy levels. All right. So 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 this one is first energy level. This one is second energy level. And this is third energy level. And interestingly, each energy level has specific number of spaces specific number of spaces that can occupied by electrons two three four five six seven eight right right and and and, and there is can be also electron right so so when there is an atom the electron in the outermost energy level these ones right here are called valence electrons All right okay so 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 valence electrons maybe you can just take a look at in the wikipedia i highly recommend you do that if you are not familiar with valence electron but so basically valence electron is the electron located at the outermost energy level and their attachment or their um, they are most free to move around because they are for they are farthest away from the neutron or actually the proton okay so so this is the valence electron and and valence electron plays a big role in primary bonding and we'll learn that 
in the later part of this lecture. Uh, the secondary or van der Waals bonding is the, another class. So this is uh, more common. This is much more common than the uh, primary bonding. And 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 um, and I believe you already you have heard about like van der Waals force, which is act acts on every uh, elements. So there are dipole dipole bonding H bonds sharing uh, um, hydrogen. Uh, polar molecule induced dipole. So there's polar molecule induced dipole, uh, fluctuation dipole. This is weakest. So so we gonna we are going to learn all these as well. Okay. All right. So so the ionic bonding. Let's take a look at the ionic bonding. As I said, this is primary. bonding okay so the iron is an atom or molecule that gains or loses electrons so so when you lose electron or when you gain an electron, you acquire an electrical charge. So when you lose electron, you will have one more proton. So you become positively charged. And when you gain electron, you become negatively charged. Right. And in a fancy way, you can say cations or anions when they gain electrons or when they lose electrons and so on right so so ionic bonds are strong bonds formed when oppositely charged ions are attracted to each other so basically it means oppositely charged ions so it's basically attraction between negative and positive charges and they are non-directional means the ions may be attracted to one another in any direction so so there is no direction it is more of a um, it can happen in any direction so so we can say uh, from this we can say a solid with ionic bonding Our solids are generally amorphous or P touch on. Okay. All right. All right. So, so the atomic radius, so atomic radius, this is atomic radius. And this is ionic radius. And as you can see, they are different. All right. So, so what you're saying is that Na is generally loses electron and because positively charged. And chlorine is generally loses, uh, gains electron and they're negatively charged. Right. And you can see that this is the actual atomic radius or diameter and and the, actually the ions the size of ions changes so so when you gain an electron you get more electron and the outside so it becomes bigger and when you lose electron it becomes more smaller so actually the atomic radius and ionic radius are different right so ionic radius is basically the distance where this charge is effective. So here's another more detailed explanation, right? So let's see. So we have um, chlorine and we have uh, Na. And this is the outermost energy level.
and there is this one electron at the very out. Here there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right. Okay. All right. And so what they can do is this electron is very unstable because it's the only electron in the energy band. However, when it goes moves into this empty spot, let me when it moves to this empty spot, it forms very stable energy level. And they become and in this case, when this is gone, this one becomes their outermost energy level. And it becomes very stable, full energy level when they lose this electron. So this is the perfect marriage. This is the perfectly matched case where this Na is becomes positively charged because it has lost an electron. And they become negatively charged because it has acquired an electron and, and and this is plus this is minus so they attract each other and they get attached so this is the main concept of an ionic bond all right so so this is the force interatomic separation curve that we have seen earlier as you can see here, there is attractive force which becomes bigger as they get close and there is a repulsive force that becomes even steeper a reduction and this force and this is the net and this is the net force, right? And we know that this is the uh, perfect distance between the atoms. And when you actually look into this formula, there's already equations that you where you can calculate the force attraction as a function of R and net force as a function of R as well. So so let's look at here the Z one R z1 so there are the there are these equations okay so z1 and z2 are the number of electrons added or removed from atoms during the ion formation so 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 actually the usually the z1 and z2 should equal to each other right because when one loses electron that moves on to another right so, so the total of number of electrons is conserved so so they should so these two values should be equal to each other. And E is the electron charge, which is this value. A is an interionic uh, inter separation distance. So this is the uh, separation distance. So, so maybe this is R, which is shown here. So maybe things will get simpler when, if we can change this to R. All right. And this epsilon is the permittivity of free space, and B and N are constants, and these constants depends on what material it is. Okay. All right. So if you look at here, attractive force is a function of r to minus 2 right it's right here and this repulsive force is a function of r2 minus n plus 1 all right and this graph makes sense when n is larger than 2 so let's see so 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 again so 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 this is more clear um drawing so when you combine all these forces and simplify this is the final solution you get Right, and again, this is, and this is, uh, 
attractive energy and this is repulsive all right okay and 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 um and this is positive and this is negative value because you can see right here and this is your that energy right this value is given, this value is given. All we need to know is these two values, which strongly depends on what type of material it is. Okay. So, so when you, when you take a look at here, all right. The bonding energies and melting temperatures. So, so, so I want this. So this is a very nice preview to what we're gonna take a look. I have mentioned that ionic bonding is strong. Also, these three, which are primary. And these two are secondary. The bonding energy is much larger for primary bonding. And, and you can see from here, the bonding energy is much higher for primary compared to the secondary bonding. All right. All right. And this is in terms of kilojoule or in terms of electron volts, they are all much bigger, right? It's an order of magnitude bigger. And that is well shown here. The melting temperature of the material with the primary bonding has much higher melting temperature, which means here, the primary bonding, which has much higher bonding energy compared to the secondary bonding requires much higher energy and the one of the most common form of energy is okay, let me write it down one of the most common form of E I'm sorry is heat All right okay let me let me let me emphasize this part Okay. Let's think about putting an energy or melting an energy, all right? So so let's talk about the water, which is most common thing that we can imagine it is in it can be exist in liquid or gas or in solid, right? And and from liquid to gas it is boiling. From solid to liquid is melt. And from salt, it can also solve it to gas in some cases, depending on the pressure or temperature. But this is thermodynamics, so I'm not going to go into that part. Right? So when we have a glass of water, right, a beaker right here, this is water. What we do to make it boil or what we do to make it gaseous state is we just burn a fire this is, this is the most we apply heat this is the one of the most this is the easiest or this is the most straightforward method to apply energy right or if there is this ice cube All right, what we do is if we apply heat, then it'll start melt 
and it will become smaller, right? Okay. So yeah, I just wanted to show off my iPad. So that drawing wasn't really necessary, but it was just for fun, right? So 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 here it is very important. We just saw that oh the bonding energy, right? It depends on the type of bondings, and different materials have different bondings, and it directly relates their melting temperature so this is a very small portion there is much more behind this and we'll get into that so so there are a key properties of sorry Oops, excuse me uh, okay so there is this key property of ionic bondings they are formed by columbic attraction between ions. It's basically colon force acting on it, forces between two different charges. It has large cohesive energy or large bonding energy. And it has low electrical conductivity. So, so I said there is no free electrons to carry current. All electrons are used to form ionic bonding. And again, one more thing, it is it it, it is unit it does not have any direction, directionality. In other words, it is not ordered. And when materials are not ordered, there is no conduction of electrical. Or, even though it does, it is very low. It is usually transparent. It is transparent to the visible light spectrum, which is the wavelength around 250 nanometers to around 600 nanometers. Or well, let me, yeah, about 350 to 600. These photon energy of visible light spectrum is too low to free electrons, right? So, yeah, this is um, photoelectric conversion. Yeah, please Google it, or I'll, I'll get into detail when we talk about photovoltaics in the later part of this class. And they are soluble in polar liquids like water. Liquid dipole of water attracts ions. So, 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 so polar liquids, the liquid, the atoms that form or molecules that form a liquid has polarity. It has directions in terms of charges. So, so, so some part is positive. Some part of H2O is positive. Some part of H2O is negative, right? And, and, and they, have this polarity it is it is polarized so they can attract the ions i'll give you a more example when we talk about this thing i will i'll explain more when we talk about covalent bonding all right yeah oh so yeah so right here there is a covalent bonding um I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so covalent bonding is involves the sharing of one or more electron pairs between atoms. All right. So, so basically, it is the sharing of one or more electron pairs between atoms. So, so two atoms share electrons, and elements that tend to form covalent bonds are those that are strongly electronegative so they have excessive number of electrons or i'm sorry or um they are not strongly electropositive or have similar electronegativities So what it means 
it is strongly electronegative. So it is missing a number of electrons. So there, they are in lack of valence electrons, right? So they want to cover their, that space. They want to bring more electrons and put more into that valence band. That's what they want to do. And covalent bonds can be formed not only between identical atoms, but also between different atoms. And by sharing electrons, The atoms completely fill their valence shell and achieve a stable octet arrangement of electrons. So what does it mean by octet is that in the second energy level, they can hold eight electrons. And when it has all eight electrons, we can have, say, there are stable octet arrangement of electrons, right? Okay, right? So usually from this, we can get a hint that covalent bonding happens for the atoms with generally with the, uh, at least a one atom with the uh, second energy level. Okay. It forms a strong localized and directional bond. So di localized and directional bond. In the direction of the greatest orbital overlap. If the atoms in a covalent bond are different from an one another, the electron pair not be shared equally between them. Such a bond is called polar covalent bond. Okay, so what does it mean is that if the atoms in a covalent bond are different from one another, so it is something like uh, H2O, right? It is not O2, or it is not H2, it is H2O. So it's a mixture of two different form of atoms. Then maybe hydrogen is giving just one electron while oxygen gets two electrons from two different hydrogens, right? Maybe I'll just draw this and give you more better uh, explanation. So, so, so um, I have mentioned about H2O. So let's say H2O, okay? Hydrogen has one electron, right? in the first energy level. Oxygen has, uh, sorry, oxygen have Eight electrons, right? I believe. All right, All right. It is missing on nice octet. It is missing these two electrons, right? And this is where this hydrogen comes in. This hydrogen comes in and shares electron. Right. And what they do is that they also, yeah, they also gain one electron from oxygen. So maybe I'll, oh, sorry about that. So hydrogen is happy because its first energy level has two electrons and oxygen is happy because its second energy level has now eight electrons, right? One oxygen gets two electrons from two hydrogen and 
each hydrogen gets one electron from oxygen. So it is a happy marriage. And this is a very nice example of covalent bond. Uh, let's talk about different example. Let's talk about uh, CH4. All right, this is methane, all right? a very um, uh, important gas for the hydrocarbon energy generation. Um, so, so C has has four valence E, and it needs four more. So basically, let's say this is C. It only has four electrons. Right here. And then we have this, let's say H, that has one. Famous E and needs four more. Oh, sorry. And needs one more. So what they do is th there is this hydrogen. So so each hydrogen there is this comes on hydrogen. And they gain one from carbon. So, so this is perfect marriage. So, so when there are two different types of atoms are merged, C is sacrificing four, H H is sacrificing one. So, so this is the type of covalent bond. And of course, since they are sharing the electrons, they are generally strong. Right, and it is common in many atoms. It can be, it can happen in one type of atoms, or can happen between different atoms. Okay, so that is it for lecture two. And I'll continue with the secondary bonding on lecture three. So I hope everyone get, has a nice weekend. Please stay safe, wear a mask. And I hope to do the lecture live using the uh, fixed LMS system on next Tuesday. Okay. And also, please, please, please leave, oops, uh, sorry, leave questions on LMS, please. All right, well, that's all I have for today, and thank you for your attention. Have a great day. Bye-bye.